Welcome to K-Wave 6 Radio, your show for all things positive. Here's your host, Kirk Spencer. Welcome to K-Wave 6 Radio. Today, my guest, as you've pretty much already seen is Ben Davidson. We've got him back again. He's like my little brother. I kind of adopted him that way. Uh, kind of hear him every day when I listen to his show, so it's a good thing. Today we also have with us Troy Matheson, who's also been here a few times. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about meteorology, but uh, with Troy here, we're probably going to address what Ben talks about a little bit on his uh, videos on a daily basis or at least every now and then, we're talking about the Electric Universe. But I want to start with Ben on a question that seems to be popping up um, periodically uh, on social media, and it was something that was talked about a little bit last year, but it seems like very few people asked the question. So I want to see if Ben has anything uh, that he can talk about from proof and or speculation, whichever it comes from. But last year, uh, the French Foreign Minister uh, with uh, our Secretary of State from the United States, uh, was his name, Kerry, John Kerry, announced that there was a 500-day, they had 500 days to do something before something dramatic with climate change. And I I forgot to look at the video before I started doing the show today. So, Ben, do you know what I'm talking about? And do you have any information about what they were alluding to last year? Right. Well, um, they were talking about the 500 Days to Climate Chaos uh, talk. And uh, what they were alluding to was, um, you know, get off of your keisters and, and do something. We mean it. Uh, and we're trying to scare you into <laughs> into thinking something huge is about to happen. Um, as you can see, uh, that 500 days is up, uh, what, in just a couple weeks here? Yeah, some around between the 15th and the 23rd, something yeah. like that. So um, as you can tell, um, things aren't fantastic, but we are not on the precipice of doom by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we do still have these record weather events which, uh, you know, pretty much everyone has predicted. Um, The only thing is we are having them in pretty much every sector, which was not predicted by many people. And what I mean by that is we have things like, for the first time ever, there's three Pacific hurricanes in the Central Pacific, or uh, earlier this summer we had six tropical storms going at one time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we also have record cold events, record heat events, record snow events, record uh, floods, record droughts, Um, pretty much have extreme weather all over the planet. And it's kind of a strange thing, you know, if if they meant the worst of it, like 500 days until uh, it's too late, it's all over, then, of course, this was an unbelievable uh, overstatement and, uh, if not blatant, fear-mongering. But when it comes to whether or not they were on the right track, well, yeah, okay, that be like saying, hey guys, I think at some point in the future there's going to be a big earthquake in California. Well, yeah, obviously, you don't have to be any kind of genius to predict that, yeah, at some point in the future a big earthquake is going to hit California. There's thing in that sentence that really uh, helps out at all. If they just meant they're going to see more climate costs in 100 days, well, I mean, yeah, of, of course we are. Um, it's really tough to know where in the middle uh, their hearts were, but I kind of feel like they were intentionally vague just so that nobody could really say they were wrong 500 days later. Hmm. Troy, do you have anything on that, by chance? Um, not, not really anything to add. Um, you know, there's a lot of work going on in the realms of law right now um, to get some of this misinformation campaign stuff that's being uh, spat out uh, like a serious drunkard. Um you know, so we're really trying to, we collectively, that is, try to get some control over the spear porn stuff because it's really, it's a mass disinformation campaign as far as I'm concerned. You know, I agree with Ben that, uh, 
they're making it sound a lot worse than it really is. We can fix a lot of this stuff. We just have some obstacles in the way that are being worked on at this time. And they should pretty much be uh, less and less of an obstacle, certainly within the next, uh, let's call it 120 to 180 days. This next four to six months is really key um, to getting some of these problems under control. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, well, yeah. Uh, I don't know if anybody's uh, familiar with a few years back. Uh, I think it was April of 2013. Don't quote me on the date. Uh, but uh, there was a group called the One People's Public Trust that, that foreclosed on all corporations. That was kind of like strike one against legal fictions having any power over natural living beings. Um, shortly thereafter, I believe it was July of 2014, the uh, Vatican issued a motu proprio, which was kind of like the second notice that, hey, this is actually the Vatican now telling you that you can no longer hide behind your legal fiction as an agent of that agency and cause injury to people for uh, victimless crimes. And so apparently most of the corporations out there in the world still didn't get the message. Um, I don't know if I don't know if I'd say most. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, I, I agreed. Um, but there's just a lot of um, uh, control systems in place where statutes are being applied against uh, natural living beings, and those statutes actually don't apply to those natural living beings in most cases unless there is consent. Um, so what's really going on right now is coordinated efforts. Um, there's there's groups involved that are wonderful folks to work with. Uh, that includes people with the FBI, with FEMA, with NSA. You know, it's it's like any of these government or so-called government agencies. The majority of the people in those agencies are good folks. Uh, it's just that the system's been run by bad folks for so long, and good people don't really want to get out there and cause problems for anybody, even if they're fellow co-workers who are causing problems for others, but uh, we've got to get out from underneath the thumb of statutory law um, because it's it's a contract-based system. We need to restore it back to natural law, and there's a huge effort right now globally to restore natural law in virtually all courtrooms across the land. I would have to agree that that is ideal. Um, do you think we have a population that's ready for that? I mean, the whole idea behind contracting generally is that you need to make sure people live up to their end of the bargain that, that are struck, and that when you rely on a promise made by another person, um, you're not at a detriment because of that. Do you think that our population is ready to live by honor in like, like a natural way? Um, I, I think so. You know, the... The law, as, as we call it today, uh, being statute-based, is so confusing, and there's so many loopholes for people to wiggle out of situations that they should not be able to, as well as get people into trouble for things that are just absolutely uh, ridiculous. And so what we're trying to do on a global level is restore law and order in a very simple way, where there's really fundamentally six different things you got to know, let's say, by the time you become an adolescent at age 13. And, and two of those have to do with natural law. In other words, do no harm and allow no harm to be done are those two tenets under natural law. And the other four just have to do with contract law. And those four tenets are full disclosure of the terms of the agreement, period, um, both as an accord and a reaccord or a record. Um, so the, the, that's the first one. Second one is equal consideration or mutually beneficial, in other words. The third one is lawful terms and conditions of the arrangement. And the fourth one is appropriate bet signatures on the contract. Let's say Ben and I decide we're going to do something together. Um, that's a verbal accord until it's been written down in writing and witnessed by some third party who's, who signs along with that. Those three wet signatures are critical on that accord for record um, for it to have any standing in a court. Otherwise, if any of those four tenets of contract law are not um, upheld, um, then that, um, let's call it a table, those four legs of that table that keeps everything on the level under equality of law, um, is not equal anymore. And you're actually talking about using a contract to commit crime against someone's unalienable rights. 
So we have to define what's different between the legal system, which is what we're all subject to today, not so much the law system, because the legal system has been allowed to transcend or trump actual unalienable rights under, under natural law. So that's kind of what's being reorganized, really, is we're just trying, we're basically getting to a point where we're going to throw out 66 and a half million statutes that are under UCC and Admiralty Maritime Law and bring it down to who got hurt by what and with which and to whom. You know what I mean? And, and if there's a valid contract, wait. If the contract is deemed, and that'll be the first thing typically to be assessed, if that contract is proven um, uh, not to stand under Four Corners Law, it, the jurisdiction immediately moves to um, un uh, unalienable rights. And that boils down to um, I'm allowed no harm to be done. So. That's interesting. It, this this really has presented a, a stark shift in in the tone of, and topic of the conversation, but I actually think it, it can be a valuable one for folks who are into these types of ideas. I, I tend to see um, exercises like going through this and thinking of how things should be and having stuff like this written down uh, and kept safe is, is a great idea, especially because we all may need to restart for a number of different reasons. Uh, I, I'm curious as to whether or not um, you agree with the idea that um, all, all of these, um, all these ideas of how society would be better. You know, if, if we didn't have the current fiat mon monetary system. You know, th there's a bunch of different ones that you hear about, and um, you know, th there's a general consensus by those who really analyze how we could get from where we are to that, you know, whatever is closer to utopia kind of thing, and they all agree that. It would we couldn't have a smooth transition. There would be a cataclysmic fall of the civilization, and it, the only way it could come about is if we decided to rebuild that way. I'm curious if you think that we could make actually some kind of smooth transition between what we're doing now and um, you know that, that ideal world you're talking about. Sure, I do think so. I think that uh, one of the highest priorities that we have in this. Uh, existence is to stop thinking about things that are external to our own self as having any meaningful value you know the, the true value is in Ben the true value is in Kirk and 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 Troy and, and the individuals who come together with others and contribute to community if, if we have a system like that we don't even have to worry about currency period whether it's fiat or asset after or, or else because as long as there's a currency that is backed on something that's ex external to one's true value, you're always going to have theft, you're always going to have robbery, you're always going to have somebody who's got more than somebody else in terms of uh, an external material asset, um, and you're always going to have crime at that rate. You know, when you're the money, when I'm the money, um, I, can't, I can't steal that from you. You know, it's your contribution, your true value, um, your creative expression that has all of the value in it. So we need to figure out how to basically migrate away, maybe over the next two to three generations, away from the concept that anything external to one's self really has no meaningful value. As soon as you start doing that kind of thing like we've always done, all of a sudden you have people saying, well, you know, I've got a coconut and you've got a walnut, but my coconut's bigger than your walnut, so you need to give me 20 walnuts to make up for this coconut. I mean, come on, really? You know, it's, it's causing problems. Well, hold on, wait a minute. First of all, if you've got walnuts and I've got coconuts, there's no way I'm giving you a coconut for one walnut. Right. Exactly. Because because the value we build into things. But no, because it's way more food than the other one. It has nothing to do with the value put into it. It's because I could feed me, my wife, and my daughter off of a coconut. A walnut won't eat one of us. Sure, That's but where's the value the coming from? It's coming from the weight in the good. No, it, it's coming from the, the sustenance of the life of the things that are, are actually important. You know what I'm uh, saying? Sure, but then we're always going to have somebody, always, who's going to try and get control of all the coconuts. When the coconut becomes just as worthless as the walnut, nobody's going to be a hoarder uh, and try and get a commercial enterprise where they control all the beavers or all the trees or all the water or, you know, so on and so forth. And, we have and to how, and, and my question is, is not is not with the the system i i i understand that the concept and i've talked actually a lot about the the idea of wow it'd be great if we could get away from the system the question really is 
how do we get there? I, I mean, with the current system in place, with the lack of incentive for those in power, and with the undeniable benefits that have come along with the shit that has come about with this system. And yeah, there are, it has its problems. It's nowhere near perfect. But at the same time, um, back when we lived in that natural law, the moment you got old or you were injured or any number of other things happen, you were dead. It was over for you. The idea of seeing old age is now gone, especially if you and your contribution is the worth. A child born at the poverty line in the United States today has access to about a thousand times better medical care than the pharaohs of Egypt. That the technology we have, the medicine we have, the social equality. Slavery is gone just about everywhere in the world. And gays can get married in this country and many other countries uh, before Noah, before you know cannabis is going to be legal all over the world. Uh, we're, we're moving in, in the right direction and yeah, okay, we have crap load problems. As we get higher on the ladder, the problems get a little tougher too. It, it's like that when you're going to beat a video game, the boss at the end of each progressing level is way more sinister and way more atrocious uh, than, than the one at the last. But at the same time, if you were to deny that things are getting better on nearly every front, yeah, we have back steps. And if you want to just talk about the last 10 years, the last 30 years, whatever you want to call it, if you look on the longer time scale, whatever has been happening on this planet has led us to a better and better and better situation. I'm not saying we don't need to tackle the current situation and problems we have now, but these are also things that people in our community don't really ever think about. Uh, agreed. You know, the, what we're really fighting here is spirits. Um, we're, we're fighting two artificial persons that haunt virtually every person on alive on Earth. And these, these artificial persons are nothing more than an ideology of some group, collective, like, for example, a collective like, uh, let's call it the, the Environmental Protection Agency, or let's call it Monsanto, or let's call it Nestle, or let's call it whatever you want to call it. But at which point a small group of people can get together, create an artificial person, and hide behind that agency while functioning, functioning as agents of that agency it, you know, you, you need to look at things like the, uh, for example, the word corporate. Where does that come from? Corpse orated. Somebody who's speaking for a dead entity. That's, that's corporation for you. And, and we can't have all of the people on Earth subjects to a policy created by a company called Nestle that's got virtually a handful of shareholders, stockholders, and, and executive board. Um, telling everybody else that we're going to throw you in jail if we catch you pulling a cup of water out of a stream because we own all of that water. That's ridiculous. Water is the heritage of every person alive on Earth. We need to decapitate the body corporate and the body politic before we're all going to be able to live um, yeah, baby free. Once again, I completely agree. And so the question is, what is one? Um, given given the undeniable truth that this whole hit the streets, make YouTube videos, try to get the word out, go pick it, go stay in the streets, go have assemblies, given the fact that that has never, ever worked, how exactly do we go and make this change? I well, don't we, have any idea. It starts with restoring law and order, and that's, that involves a whole bunch of different groups that are actually uh, very well coordinated, have been for years now. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the FBI, the U.S. Marshals, FEMA, and NSA, the majority of those agents of those agencies are actually looking for the same kind of answers we're talking about here now and are getting ready to come down for example in the case of law enforcers um, that thin blue line must be erased you know they say that uh, one bad apple doesn't spoil the whole bunch but if you've got one guy out of ten who's a bad guy at the apartment and the other nine guys aren't doing anything about it then they're all guilty as aiding and abetting as accessories in the commission of crimes against other people's unalienable rights and that's what's the, what's changing. We need a new kind of court. We need enforcement that actually, um, you know, uh, handles those warrants, those subpoenas, those summons. And, and I think that's the first step, is getting law and order restored. And to do that, we have to basically kill UCC at the moment, in the short run, and redefine what commercial codes are. And uh, same with Admiralty Maritime. And we really need to keep those two distinctions uh, UCC being applicable on any transactions that occur on land, if we're even going to keep that 
uh, Roman Curia system at all. And right now it's looking like we need to really just throw that book out. That book has caused more suffrage on this planet over the last 1,400 years or better um, than should have ever been permitted. Hey, try, let me ask you a question, and I'll return it to you guys. You guys are having a great conversation. I'm loving listening to this. But I think, you know, Ben, you can correct me on this, I think what he's asking, which is pretty much the same question that I always ask, is people are pretty much accustomed to the system that we have right now. And they find there's a certain comfort level in it, and they just go, okay, that's what I have to live with, that's what I have to deal with. How are you actually going to make the public, or not make, but inspire the public to, mm, say, better themselves? How do you do that? Um, and sorry, is that a question for Ben or for, for me? No, that, 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 that is the question I, I've been, like, tr- attempting to ask. I've agreed with every single thing you've said, and I thought... You know, with just literally 10 minutes of searching online, you could probably find 10 or 15 other people just like you who also have great ideas uh, Mm -hmm. and and things like that. My question is, this whole, you know, starting petitions, this whole going and marching on the street, making YouTube videos, using social media, it is definitively a failing effort on that front. So what is it that is going to allow this to happen when it's been clear every single time that uh, any effort we make to try to reach out to the public, whether that be through Anonymous or through Occupy Wall Street it, it, or whatever, it eventually gets infiltrated and taken over and becomes a controlled opposition mm-hmm. type of thing. And we just do not have the skill or the resources to deal with that. We're fighting a very losing battle that way. So my question is, w- not what actions do we take to to make it better in the in the ideal world what actions do we take to get through to these people and even if we get through to the majority of the people what kind of guarantee does that give us uh that you know the people who actually are in control uh don't have a way to stop everyone from revolting i mean we've never really seen them use their microwave weapons right. we've never really seen them use ULF or, or VHF on a massive scale against a population. Um, it, it, how in the world do you expect to accomplish this thing? And it, bear in mind, I agree with everything you say about things that need, need to go and things that should be better. What is? How do you? How do you go about doing this? Well, uh, again, it comes through the formation of new types of courts. Uh, an example would be natural justice. That's what those folks are trying to do. Um, you know that we we have to get we have to get to a fourth branch of government mind space because we've been trusting people uh, in administrative, judicial, and legislative branches because uh, quite honestly we're all inherently lazy. You know we don't want to uh, we don't want to go out in our yard and face the guy who we think is looking out of our window at three in the morning. We want to call the police, call nine one one, and say, hey, have somebody come deal with this. I don't want to. And, and when we entrust those people and they fail us, we have to have a system of enforcement so that a, a warrant can be issued and th- those individuals can be brought before a natural law court, not a Roman Curia court, because all of our courts basically in probably most of every country on the nation, or I mean on the planet, uh, is serving the Vatican at the end of the day. And that has to go. We can't have freeloaders who sit around and build themselves fortunes through the absolute abject theft through their constructive fraud systems and their graft. Um, so I don't know. How do we get everybody on the planet to dishonor um, that kind of system? I don't know. I, I think education is the key. I think it's going to take some time. As far as rectifying all these damages, that takes coordinated efforts amongst literally thousands of different entity types and that is what i and and that's what i was talking about earlier this Mm -hmm. is not something new that that we're doing right now in this basically uh i don't know whether whether you will understand what i mean when i call it a a quiet stirring revolution um Mm -hmm. but this has been something that has waxed and waned for many many years and you know (laughs) this is the kind of thing where it's been analyzed. Uh, there was a lot of talk about this uh, back around the time of uh, Vietnam, 
Uh, there was a lot of talk about this back in uh, the early 2000s. There was talk about this during the financial collapse a few years later, and it's, you know, it's it's a very it's considered a valid topic to to be analyzed, and the answer always comes down to um, anything that could be tried um, would be as a ripple in a streaming river. Um, you can make a little ripple, but you are not going to stop where this river is going. And so that's why that's what I meant. When I said every every professional who has ever analyzed this, because believe me, philosophers, um, everything down to like teams of like biologists and city planners and politicians have come together. I mean, it, this has been analyzed from every way possible, and they see no way it happening without a collapse and just having that be system that is built from scratch. They don't see it happening with more than 10% of the population remaining. They don't see it happen with us still having electricity and our infrastructure and our water system and everything else and our telecommunications. It's you go back to the Stone Age and you try again kind of thing. Uh, that's how you'll, you'll do this. There is no stopping the river according to just about everyone. And when you really think about it, and if you understand just a bit about mass psychology, uh, you realize that this is where people are going. Um, e even the folks who, you know, it, this is something that was really difficult for me to come to grips with uh, at first when I realized it. But I sort of had this idea at first that everybody who was subscribed to my YouTube channel was kind of was kind of the same. We all thought the the same kind of stuff, and we were all awake. We were all aware of the the real Matrix kind of thing, uh, but. At, it's become readily apparent to me that vast majority of people think the stuff is kind of cool, but that's really where it stops for them. The vast majority of these people, even if they recognize how wrong something is and how much they've been lied to, how things should be, they will never step out of line. And um, I'm, I would love for that not to be the case. You know? Well, they will follow at which point something clicks within those individuals that says, hey, it's safe enough for me to proceed. But as you know, uh, at least in my experience, uh, out of every hundred people I talk to, two of them actually act upon the words that come out of their mouth. The other 98 people are dreamers that just spew, um, and they have lots of good ideas, but do they actually get behind those ideas and apply the appropriate action needed to be able to manifest the visualization to a reality? No. So what we need is some leaders, and there are a lot of them, and things are coordinated. And I'm, uh, I'm imagining that by the end of this year, we're going to see some major stuff come out that's going to be the catalyst needed to get everybody onto a more tribal page instead of a feudal ownership page, which we're all under now. Well, I, I can tell you that if a bunch of folks at the NSA and the FBI and a bunch of the other alpha boys all came together and sort of condemned how things are done and created their own court, that would be the kind of thing um, that could be a good start. I have heard claims of similar things many times since 2011, and I'm in the boat where, like, wow, uh, that would be great if it had uh, until I see it. It's a dream kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's tough to see the incentive and the capability to, right. to, to, to throw a wrench into the Leviathan. Well, I tell you this much. I've been working on my aspect of what I do uh, for about 10 years now. Um, it, the catalyst for me was um, ending up in court. Um, the case was thrown out before I even had to look before the judge because I kind of gave... Uh, the DA and the sheriff and the judge a heads up that I was going to expose their court constructor fraud before everybody in the courtroom and potentially have them arrested uh, while I was supposed to be in there as a defendant. So since then, I've really been focusing a lot this last 10 years on law-related issues and the formation of a true universe people's court. You know, so that's, that's kind of rolling there, but you're right. I mean, I've worked with some people that are actually now deceased that started working on this stuff clear back when JFK was shot, you know. So, as you know, we're trying to change the world here um, for the better of all. And that's not an easy system when you figure about 1% of 1% is pretty much in control of most everything. Right. So, right. 
thank goodness for the internet because the information age is making it harder and harder for these kinds of criminals to hide behind closed doors and make decisions that affect virtually everyone on the planet. Troy, let me ask you a question again. Uh, I, I, I'm sexually kind of, if you want to say I'm siding with someone, I'm kind of siding with Ben here because I, I see it even per my last podcast from last week, uh, the one that was called Should uh, Should We Prolong the Big Game, Big Game Being Life. And they bring up a lot of things that I see on a daily basis, you know, just being on social media and other stuff and reading the news and all that kind of stuff. I think, personally, you're running a very steep uphill battle. Not saying that it can't be done. I'm just saying it's going to take some time. Because even as Ben and I have spoken about this a few times, you know, we were talking about this even yesterday. Where does all this information come from? And there's always somebody out there that has a theory about something. And it's, it's like there's always going to be a small group or maybe a large group. I don't know. Uh, that has a belief in something and no matter how much truth, how much facts you throw at them, they just don't want to hear it. It's just their beliefs are going to be the things that's in forefront for them. So how do you plan on doing all that? Well, uh, as you guys both know, um, you can change the world in a sentence or a song or a whatever. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I'll give an example of, of my experience. When I got really serious here in Oregon, uh, with about half a dozen people, we decided that we were going to restore common law juries in all of the courts in the state of Oregon. We had 36 counties that we had to go through processes, lawful and legal processes on, to get that happening. We started that um, in January of 2014, and actually about 12 of us had all 30 counties constituted by the people of Oregon um, under uh, common law by June 23rd. So it took us about six months, basically, to get all of the counties restored. Now, we've got almost 4 million people in Oregon, and it was, took uh, literally 12 of us to make that happen for everybody else. That's how, um, uh, un you know, people are uh, unbelieving that even 12 people can come together and make that kind of a difference. I mean, you could yeah. ask people in the state if that could have been possible and they would have said oh no forget it you're, you're, well you're, you know i mean I, believe it or not i think that um that's the kind of thing that that's another one of those things that can really be a catalyst uh for example places where we've seen success in this realm uh think about some of the small um anti-gmo campaigns where they have gone and gotten the local government to ban the growing of genetically modified foods in the area it, it's the same basic concept but with a different uh topic and you know, I actually did a little bit of investigating of this, and I found that for every win our community has, we get about 10 losses on the other side. Um, right. we're, we're literally drowning. Uh, we're literally drowning in the mainstream and the propaganda. And every time we reach up and grab another rung on the ladder, I, it, they've already put five more rungs up at the top. You know, it, okay. it, there has to be something, something bigger. Um, and the key to that is killing currency, because that is the power mechanism. The people who are the powers that be and or the powers that were, that's what gives them their power. Because these people, they may be millionaires and billionaires, but honestly, at the end of the day, most of their wealth was actually built through theft. Honestly. You know, you've got a better chance of becoming king of the world than you do of ridding this fiat m money system. It is it is the source of the power of everyone who has it right now. And unfortunately, what I was alluding to before is I think that that power has superseded the power of the population. Right. In general. They can push a button and drop a thousand people standing in front of them, marching at them, you yeah. know. It, so the exactly. question is, um, you know, I, well, we all know what the question is, and it, it, this is tough because uh, you know I, I wish you hadn't said I'm siding with Ben because it makes it sound like he and I are against each other, and we're so not. I've agreed with literally everything he said. You no, know, I understand. You know, it's I've just, agreed with everything yeah. he said. I just. Uh, I just said it loosely, but it was just a yeah, point well, of I mean, uh, I, what you're even talking about with philosophy. It's just we just seem to have to 
crash, burn, and then start all over again. And that's what I'm just talking about there. Yeah, it's just it's sort of this completely circular thing that I I go through every time I try to think about the free energy debate and how um, if you're really paying attention, you know that free energy not only probably exists, but there are a few folks who have probably known about it for a very long time. And it seems like there are a lot of comes from companies and individuals about things they can do. And then when it comes time to see it, something doesn't work. Um, and and I've, I've sort of come around to a completely different uh, struggle with the topic in general. My struggle is imagine if you're the person that has to decide whether or not to give the world free energy and how you give them free energy. Um, what do you do? Because here's the thing. This is one of the things where um, tapping in to unlimited power, as insanely complex as that sounds, is insanely si- more simple than controlling that unlimited power. It's the kind of thing where you couldn't cork it back up once it was released. If you got to the point where there was enough knowledge about free energy and enough understanding of it, uh, so basically that the entire world could have it as their infrastructure, uh, the ability to tap into free energy and use it for destructive purposes would be about grade six or seven science. Imagine if the Columbine kids had a free energy option or every drug dealer in the ghetto or the Unabomber or every crazy leader across the country like in Iraq or, say, George Bush. Uh, you know, what if, what if really you gave free energy to the people? Look how we act with limited resources. Could you imagine if we had all we wanted? I can tell you that if I was in that situation... I, I can't tell you how I would eventually come out, but I would not just immediately give free energy to the world. I, I wink that, oh my God, for, for the sake of our entire population, it has, all right, we have to have it, but we have to keep it controlled by a very small number of people. And I'm, then it hits me, ah, oh, crap, that's exactly where we are now. And the only question that remains is, okay, whoever these people are, what gives them the right and who voted them to be able to make these decisions. And there's a couple ways to think about that. If there are people who have just sort of risen there through this system and they just sort of inherited that power um, or whatever, then I would say they don't deserve it. But if they discovered the secrets or perhaps um, they had, you know, they know things we don't know, like how to take a population full of essential logical creatures and steer it towards healthier lives in general. Yeah, there's hiccups along the way, and it turns out that recently a lot of our progress has turned out to result in poisons for us, but, you know, we're coming around to that. People know about fluoride. People are learning about GMOs. Somebody asked me about chemtrails in every single city I went in. And so there are cycles of up and downs, and in the downs it always seems like shit's about to hit the fan and things couldn't be any worse, and in the ups you realize just how far you've come in the last 50 or 100 cycles. And so you, you kind of get where I'm, I'm going with this. There's, there's this. There's this sort of moment where you have to sit and wake a second time. It's one thing to wake up once and realize that you've been lied to and there's this whole other world of fascinating stuff to, that's right in front of your face and you just got to take the time to go look at it. You know, that's waking up once. When you wake up a second time and realize that those voices that you heard on the internet t- talking about how everything is going down and everything is evil and everybody is this and everything is that, you have to realize that there's there's a second awakening and that is when you let go of that anger, which it which is really just masking fear of all of these crazy and scary stories that you've heard. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I, I don't really know any other way to say it, but uh, that's. <laughs> Welcome to the awake community. That's what we are. And there, it's like a stepping stone. You wake up on Alex Jones, and then when you realize what's real and what's not, you become a suspicious observer kind of thing. Um, I, I see a very different um, I see a very different lead-in to that eventual future, which I really do think uh, is is the better one, the one he's been talking about all, all show here. Um, mm-hmm. But the way it's really going to happen is, you know, this planet and our way of life doesn't have 
that long left. And I don't mean, you know, our ability to, to find water and our ability to breathe the air. I mean our ability to use electricity and our ability to uh, grow and ship food all across the world and things like that. Um, what we need is things like what we've heard about, you know, the ideas for how to make things better. As manifestos wrapped, uh, wrapped tightly, watertight, right alongside our organic heirloom seeds um, in our books on pre-industrial farming. You know, I've talked a little bit uh, recently on a number of uh, different places about how, how shocked I really was about the events of late June. And uh, by that I mean the fact that, you know, I'm sitting here waiting to be the guy who makes the call whether or not, you know, a certain level of X-class solar flare is going to be the one where I tell people, okay, this is one you worry about. You know, I, I'm sitting here, I'm the guy debating, is that at X-10, is that at X-15, is that at X-20? Here we have a couple of little M-class solar flares take out aviation radar, take out digital banking systems, take out satellites. Uh, God forbid those had been X-class solar flares, it was over. Um, you know, and that's... We're losing our magnetosphere. And even as the sun goes into this quieter, calmer period, it's still going to have outbursts, and it just takes one. Things like three canes in the Pacific just weeks after um, six tropical storms across the planet is the kind of thing where we're seeing weather phenomenon that happened once every 20 years or so. We're happening, they're happening once a month, once every couple of weeks. It's going to get to the point where you're going to, you know, you're going to have snow at night and you're going to have to worry about your plants overheating and dying during the day. Uh, this is how the weather shifts when the magnetosphere weakens at the same time the sun goes into this uh, this grand minimum period, which it's going into and will it, it'll basically dominate the next few years. Um, pretty much everyone listening to this, that is the majority of your useful life, if not all of it, if you're listening to this. And, you know, I don't know when the magnetosphere is going to reverse, if that's going to be tomorrow, if that's going to be in 20 years, if that's going to be in 50 years. I do know that we have virtually, uh, I don't want to say virtually no chance, but we have a very small chance of living like this 100 years from now. We have a much greater chance of fighting wars with sticks and stones at that point. Um, and that has pretty much guided um, most of what I talk about, most of the prepping I do. However, um, you know, there is a guy who he just poured his heart out one day on this blog about you know how how money and credit and social welfare would be in a world without fiat currency. I printed it out and it is sitting in a box with a number of other things I consider very important along with my heirloom seeds and a book I have on pre-industrial farming because the um, the ideas, the mental exercises, the, the discussions that, that we started having on on this show here are the kinds of things that are going to rebuild society. Um, just as uh, just as the compass and square will be essential to rebuilding society, so will um, so will this. The, the ideas about how things were. And you know, I, as unfortunate as to say, things like current laws um, they can help guide us because there are a lot of situations that you know the the pragmatism and the precedent aspect of the law uh, I believe has a lot of value this whole oh wow well we thought we legislated and put the statutes but hey this is a situation that just happens sometimes in life it might be good to know what to do in these types of situations um, but yeah I, I can see where a lot of the over complexity would would need to. The, the point I'm trying to make is uh, I think that the conversation we started having on this show is different, is, is valuable for a different reason. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just me. Well, that's all right. I had to go because, oh, you're an attorney as well as a meteorologist, so I just figured I'd just let it go and see where it just naturally went. 
Uh, while you're back on that subject, let me ask a couple of questions, Troy. I, I know you have something there. We'll let you do that in just a moment. We're not running on the time limits here, so it's not a problem, but um, at least not from my end, put it that way. Uh, ben, you were just talking about things, and I had to write them down. I think you already know I do that when somebody's speaking, so I don't have to interrupt them with my thoughts. You're talking about the magnetosphere weakening, uh, and just a bunch of questions. If you need to repeat them, I'll do it. Uh, the magnetosphere weakening, you've talked about uh, pressure, how that affects the pressure on Earth, which you have explained in the shows how the pressure actually works to cause and to quell storms. Um, if the pressure is down, the magnetosphere is weakening, uh, does that mean that if we were to have a, uh, a solar flare or one of these filaments actually broke loose in Earth directions, would that cause a major problem because this magnetosphere is weakening? And uh, the last two questions basically are, uh, the Finland's, I think it's Finland, that has that seed bank that they sealed up a couple of years ago, uh, how does that work with, or does it have anything to do with what we started the show with, the 500 days to climate chaos and all the rest of that? And uh, in our last show, we talked about the North and South Pole movement towards each other. So I'll leave you with that answer however you want to go. Well, at, at the start, I would say that, yeah, having the, having the magnetosphere is what stops the sun from taking away the electricity across the globe. Um, because if, if we didn't have that, yeah, okay, our atmosphere would slowly be eaten away. But upon the first significant eruption everything that had a copper wire in it would melt and burn. Uh, there would be a no, be no electricity and no way to fix it. There'd be no gas stations, there'd be no telephones, there'd be no nothing, really. It would be literally as if everything electronic was just vanished from the planet in one day. Um, vanished or destroyed. So, um, th that's, that's sort of the, the blur extremes. There's no evidence that it would ever completely disappear. Uh, and during a full magnetic reversal, it would just get very weak. But yeah, that's one of the things you worry about. In addition to the fact that this is going to really wreak havoc with the weather, with seismic activity, and with volcanic activity, um, those are those things would be difficult enough to deal with uh, without the loss of electricity. And um, what was that second one again? Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. The uh, okay with the magnetosphere being weakened or continue weakening, weakening uh, solar flaring and these filaments, these sun filaments, uh, if they were to s smack the earth, if you want to call it that way, uh, I think you just answered that one. So yeah, yeah, th that's the one I just answered. The yeah, okay. Uh, the seed banks, uh, the seed bank in Finland and the North and Pol South Pole movement, and does that... In your in your studies or your opinion, does that have anything to do with this 500 days to climate chaos? No, their their 500 days to climate chaos thing was literally a nonsense story. Uh, okay. they, they picked an arbitrary start date and an arbitrary end date. It's utterly meaningless. Um, but in terms of the the seed vault, it's a preparation, like so many other things that are going on. You know. Um, the U.S. government didn't buy 10 million body bags because they're going to kill 10 million people. They bought 10 million body bags in case they need them because they don't want a plague breaking out in the United States from lack of ability to deal with dead bodies. Um, the weather's going to get violent. Um, the bacterial fluctuations in the environment are going to become extreme, and we're going to see um, extreme mutations in bacteria. Uh, and these things are going to be pushing our immune systems to the limit. And in addition to the, the fluctuation of weather, you know, switching from cold to hot to, to cold to hot to cold to hot is one of the things every year that some people just sets them off. Well, imagine that happens every day. Um, and, not, yeah, you'll start to react to it, but the bacteria will react to it as well. Literally every way in which you could imagine, this, these shifts that are going right now are population bottlenecks. They are meant to separate the wheat from the chaff, even if not consciously through any being. It's just what nature does. And um, 
you know, there will be more volcanoes that go off because as the sun weakens and our magnetosphere weakens, those are two things that protect Earth from galactic cosmic rays. Uh, and they're both weakening at the same time. Galactic cosmic rays are, we know, what stirs magma to the point of large volcanic eruptions. And so the air is going to be far more toxic. Um, you absolutely have a right to be worried about, uh, you know, if they're spraying aluminum oxides or any other amount of stuff. But uh, to be honest, you're you're subjected to far, far worse chemicals than, uh, than chemtrails on a daily basis. And if the volcanoes start going off on the planet, forget about it. Um, it it's the kind of thing where there really is no other way to explain this except consider our ancestors these are the people upon which our mathematics is built our architecture is built. these people understood how to track the planets and yet we take their stories of what they saw in the skies and all, all around them and we completely discard it as fantasy because we have no frame of reference for it we have no way to dis we have no way to validate or even understand what they claim happened. Well, this is what happened. Their golden age was shattered by what appeared to them uh, only be describable as the wrath of the gods. The same thing that made those diligent astronomers and architects and mathematicians write seemingly crazy stories might just be about to happen again now. You, you think those people were stupid? The people who were tracking the planets and who could predict eclipses 10 years in advance and literally were, are the people who are responsible for the foundations of our mathematics. You think those people just wrote these stories down for no reason? Mm -hmm. And uh, th this is unfortunately what, what we've got here. And if you're careful looking through history, the last 300 years has been the most behind to our way of life you could ever imagine um, but we're due for long overdue for a change and I see the the ideas that were put forth at the beginning of, of this show and things like it as having extraordinary value the day after that happens and the years after that happens um, and for the time being I see it as um, a necessary but not necessarily immediately practical um, exercise. Uh, if, if that is going to turn everyone off, need I remember, remind everyone that um, if you don't prepare and you don't think about these things, uh, nothing ever gets done. It has to get done. Somebody has to be thinking uh, this way and coming up with the ideas like the ones we heard earlier in the show. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can really talk and talk, can I? <laughs> Go ahead. You'd say or ask. I'm not sure which. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, beautifully stated, Ben. Really. Good. Thank you. Ah, uh, definitely. Well, oh, well, uh, last question here, um, Ben. We talked about this, and actually, I think I took a copy of this. I think it was from your website where you were showing the North Pole going into Siberia, South Pole going up in towards the Indian Ocean. What's going on with that? That was been a while, so is that still going that way? Is it speeding up, slowing down, changing directions? What's going on? Well, unfortunately, uh, we'll wait a few years probably to get another update on that. We get updates once every five years, which actually uh, is about appropriate. You can't really do too much checking before that because you don't really have a whole lot of frame of reference. So, for example, we have a, a wobble of the magnetic pole of about 80 miles every day and about 360 miles on average every year. So, for example, this is why every six months you'll see somebody popping up on the Internet and saying, uh, the North Pole has shifted 180 miles or it shifted 200 miles just in the last six months. We're all doomed uh, three weeks from now. Um, well, yeah, it has moved that much, but it's about to go move back the other direction the next six months. And so what they do is, is if they look five years later and they see, okay, this is where it's progressing over this five-year span. So um, I assume you're talking about magneticreversal.org and was with the 2015 updates. So um, unfortunately, unless Swarm uh, from the ESA or some other magnetic mission, you know, NASA's about to launch the MMS, um, 
unless we get some other kind of information about the strength of the magnetosphere, I, I think that's about all. I, I, I don't expect to get another pole position mm -hmm. for five years. Uh, okay, that's one reason why I really have you back on the show, is as you're explaining stuff that other people, as you're saying, they get on YouTube and going, ah, oh, we're all doomed, we're going to go, mm, whatever. So <laughs> I just had to come up with somebody that can well, actually... You know, the, the, inter the interesting thing is this person, uh, they, they're not incorrect in how far the North Pole has moved in the past six months, and their mathematics uh, are, are not incorrect about extrapolating forward because they can see, wait a minute, okay, if it allegedly moved this far in this many years, and then it just moved this much in six months, that is this much acceleration, oh my god, we've passed the tipping point, and we're on the roller coaster now on the downhill towards the bottom and uh, it's just days or weeks away uh, but you know, none of that math is incorrect what's incorrect is the misunderstanding that yeah there's motion one way for six months and then it comes back the other direction the other six months and maybe you're only a mile or two from where you started lately uh, it's been closer to uh, you know it's been closer to 20 to 50 miles away from where they started but um, Still, we have an acceleration of the poles, and so it, on one hand, it, that person wakes up a lot of people. For some reason, um, every time this person does it, it gets spread through social media faster than you could imagine. And there's tens of thousands of new people interested in these sorts of topics. And yeah, we lose half of them over time due to the lack of interest. Another um, quarter because they uh, they're constantly caught in this weekly doom cycle, but yet a quarter of them wake up again and start to dig deeper and either they they are actively observing or they're actively thinking or they're um, you're just paying attention trying to do as best they can to go day to day because uh, for a lot of folks life is not so easy and um, trying to wake up and wake up again and think about these things and have the time to do the diligent research and do all that other stuff it, it's really not possible um so it's it's the kind of thing where um, you want people to wake up to it, uh, but at the same time we have to realize exactly where people's limitations are. Yeah, I, I got into this thing years ago. I, well, that's a long story. Again, trying to make it short is just I grew up in me or. Um, as if you will a community where it was a great deal of focus on the gloom and doom of society and whatnot and i suppose that's where i come up with the thing of <clears throat> yeah you have to as my keywords are saying pressing the reset button uh, you said it's just the complete collapse of society in the world and then starting all over sticks and stones and just build it hopefully a better society in the future but uh, I tend to watch now uh, society and just kind of watch where they go, or I shouldn't say they because it's just making myself sound like I'm just removed from them. Watching how society actually goes, which way they tend to lean, and I tend to see the majority, at least from my opinion, uh, lean towards the scare factors and uh, oh, we're going to hit this, and like you're saying, they... I'm not saying their math was wrong or anything. It's just that they tend to feed into that fear part, as you've said many times about the French foreign minister and the 500 days to climate chaos. And yeah, they're scaring people. And it, for me, it's just another way to control masses. As you well, said, money and fear. Those are two basic things I can see from just right off cuff are the controlling factors in society. Well, I, I'll tell you another thing. The, si the same kind of person whose idea it was to pull a stunt like that 500 uh, days to climate chaos thing, yeah. um, that the kind of person who had the idea to get our community terrified of something like Jade Helm so they could see how we react to mm -hmm. it. You know, I, anything we've heard this much about and has been talked about this much you can be pretty sure it's going to be anything serious. Um, but think about everything they've learned about our community through Jade Helm. It's been one of the greatest learning opportunities of whatever action or group is controlling the opposition, a.k.a. us. Um, it, has been it has been the most successful 
uh, action against our group in terms of getting us to buy into something uh, since Harp. I, I it is the single most successful since Harp. Uh, I, there's no other way to put it. It has been an unbelievable win on the part of I, I don't know. I guess you'd call it our enemies, <laughs> uh, but such is the despair I live with day in and day out. <laughs> I had a question for you, Ben, if I may. Sure. Um, a while back, um, I would guess about four or five months ago, Kirk and I were doing some shows on uh, frequencies, energies, and uh, vibrations and existence. And uh, one of the things we looked at was the Schumann resonance, which I understand was historically since its discovery at about 7.83 cycles per second until about January of 2011, I guess. And uh, so we tried to do some prediction on uh, how high that frequency was going to go up because it was at about 16 and a half cycles about three or four months ago. And so we tried to project ahead to figure out how long it would be before it hit 20 cycles and we came up with 22 months. However, I just heard day before yesterday that the Schumann resonance is now up above 21.5. What do you know about them? What do you think the sun's influence has on that increase in the Schumann resonance? Well, the, um, the Schumann resonance actually spans the range from basically down to, from down zero up mm-hmm. to, uh, let's say up to 56 or it, it may even be more. But there are peaks of the Schumann resonance, uh, and there's a number of them. Hold on, you know, there's there's no sense in me not remembering. Let me just go ahead and find these. Thank you. I know exactly where to go looking for them. A whole second. Okay, Schumann resonances. Yeah. All right, where are those peaks? All right, so uh, the peaks. All right, the, the spectrum ends around three hertz and extends up to sixty hertz. There are distinct peaks at seven point eight three. 14.3, 20.8, and 33.8. I have heard a lot of people talk about changes in the peaks. Uh, in terms of you want to pick anything between 3 and 60, technically there, there are Schumann resonances that are detected there at 21, at 29, at 51.44. Uh, uh, but what we would be talking about is is a change in the peaks of the Schumann resonance. And so uh, if that has changed recently, um, I, I've heard about it. I haven't seen any of the papers or seen any of the data on it. Um, I know I've asked for it from a, f- a couple of folks who have mentioned it to me. I don't, I don't think I ever got it or I would have checked it out. That's the kind of thing I would love to check out because it would really be indicative of a changing interplay, a changing relationship energetically between the Earth uh, and our protective interface, which is the magnetosphere. Um, We're learning that lightning strikes are heavily modulated by cosmic rays and solar wind. Well, what modulates the cosmic rays and solar wind's effect on Earth is the magnetosphere. If there is a change in the Schumann resonance peaks, uh, I don't know what could be causing it other than a greater access, or a, a change in access of the solar wind and cosmic rays to Earth, which, you know, the gatekeeper is the magnetosphere. So I would certainly have to imagine it's related. Thank you so much. Hmm. Cool. All right. Uh, ben, I know that you, that you only want to stick with a, about an hour-long show. I know you always have a lot to going on over there and sta- uh, stash. Sorry. Hello, other brother. Troy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, you I'm, you've, you weren't able to hear my daughter crying in the background too much. Uh, I actually didn't even hear. But yeah, that's okay, and I've got on headphones too. Yeah, Anyhow, yeah. go ahead, uh, Troy. Oh, I said um, uh, nor I. I didn't hear anything. So no. yeah. yeah, actually, if I you did. just want to get her to say "goo goo gaga" on the on the microphone, go ahead and say hi. <laughs> she she knows how to scream. That's about where it's. <laughs> Welcome to Parenthood. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I wanted to just thank both of you for being here. Thank you for this wonderful conversation that just went from to from climate to law, back to climate and energy. So yeah, this I thought that was pretty wonderful. cool how we did that. I thought that was yeah. 
it was fun. <laughs> Definitely. So maybe we'll do it again in the future. We'll see how things it, go. This is this is the kind of this is the kind of uh, talk I'd love to embed on my site as well. Right. Yeah, matter uh, of fact, I'll, I'll I'll link back to to your so people get to the blog and stuff. Okay. And uh, let me say goodbye. Say so, to finish the buys. So. Um, don't go anywhere, but uh, thank you, Troy. Thank you, uh, Ben, for being here. Thank you for such a wonderful conversation on the topics that we did cover. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, maybe if we hear from you in the future, we'll do this again if these guys are willing. So anyway, take care. Thank you. And if you guys want to say goodbye, here's your time. Go ahead, Ben. Well, as a... Uh I'd just like to say that the, it's a pleasure to be back here again, and uh, as always, uh, if you just Google suspicious observers, you won't get all the way through it. They'll know what you're looking for, and uh, it's interesting to check us out. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, while you're here, uh, you've got this conference coming up next month? Yes, it's Observing the Frontier. Uh, next month, we're going to have basically the uh, well, all the folks that do... Uh, sort of the stuff that we do a uh, couple professors, a couple folks uh, who spend most of their time at NASA but have found an interest in this stuff outside of uh, their work um, yeah it's going to be a lot of fun it's going to be uh, in Pittsburgh in October and then in Phoenix in January are your tickets for next month's uh, event, event sold out yet? Or they are not has... sold out they are uh, still tickets available uh, it would be the kind of thing where if we overcrowded the room, it would be an utter shock for anything scientific to do. But uh, at this point, we already have uh, quite a number of okay, people. Cool. And I used to live in Phoenix, so being in Phoenix in January, it's a nice thing. It's cool, but it's not cold. So uh, what's the date on that one? Uh, that is the 30th and the 31st. Of January. Yes. Yeah, okay. And you can find all that information at... Uh, all of the information is at suspiciousobservers.org. There you go. Okay, Troy, anything? Thank, yeah, I just wanted to thank both of you so much. I, I greatly appreciate you and your work. So thank you for having me on the show today and uh, to all the listeners as well. And love this. Wishes and blessings to all of you. Thank you. All right, we'll see you again soon. Take care and be well. Thank you for joining us for today's show. We hope you found today's show interesting and of value to your life. Please visit our website at www.kwave6radio.tk. That's www.kwave6radio.tk. Follow our blog titled What's New for all upcoming shows and events. You can follow us easily by clicking the RSS feed icon on the blog page or via Twitter and our Facebook page. Also, visit the Freedom Talk Radio Network and SETV site at www.freedomtalkradio.co.uk for more interesting programming. All of the K-Wave 6 radio programs are archived on our YouTube channel. See our homepage for more information. As always, all the best.